Welcome back. Last week, we talked about the foundation of our faith. What is the foundation of the Christian faith? Our faith is based not on a person's teachings or a philosophy or a way of thinking or even on a sacred book, but on the historical event that happened on Jesus' resurrection. So if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is useless. What are some evidences we talked about last week that Jesus did rise from the dead? We talked about how the world 2000 years later is so different and we can see what Jesus' resurrection, how it's affected culture and history. We also talked about how the eyewitnesses like Peter and others died because they refused to admit that they'd made up the resurrection. What's the difference in them dying because they would not say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead and if I was willing to die because I would not say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. We talked about the eyewitness accounts, how they were written down and then copied and circulated soon after Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension, when the eyewitnesses were still alive. Why does that matter? It matters because if stories were circulated while the eyewitnesses were still alive, they could correct anything that was maybe incorrect in them and, and explain more about them. How do I know that the Bible I have today is accurate? If the stories about Jesus, about what he said and did were told and retold until they were written down and then they were copied and copied and copied, how do I know the copies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that I have today are the same as the first ones that were written down and spoken about? Well, that's another big question. Before we jump into that question, let's zoom back a little bit. What even is the Bible? The Bible means the book. Let's all look at one, like literally, your life group leader can pass out Bibles to at least one between every two people. If you need to, pause the video now so you can all get Bibles and open it up to the table of contents. Looking at that table of contents in pairs, take a few minutes to talk about what questions you have. Looking at the book's table of contents, what do you wonder about how we got the Bible or what it is or who wrote it or any questions at all? Take a minute to talk about that and then leaders in a few minutes call everyone's attention together and ask one or two people to share what questions and thoughts they came up with in their pairs. The first thing we can notice looking at the table of contents is that the Bible is not a book. It's actually a library of 66 different books written at different times by different human authors. The Bible, it's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So. What is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling, and they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. Then at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible, what's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. 
The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the law. That's Israel's five-book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. What do you notice comparing the Jewish order of the Old Testament and what's the order of the Old Testament in your Bible's table of contents? The order is different because when Christians started printing Bibles together in a book, like once the technology of a codex, which is basically like a bound book as we think of it, was developed. And yes, a book is a technology because before that everything had to be written on scrolls. And so it was super obvious then that the Bible was a library of books because you'd literally have a shelf of different scrolls, the Genesis scroll, the Exodus scroll, and so on. So when Christians arranged them together in a single binding, they chose to put the prophecies at the end of the Old Testament because they led into Jesus. But otherwise, the Bible that we have today is the exact same Old Testament that every Jewish person still uses today and who, what they used in the days of Jesus. This is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now. A few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff, was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So people believe that God was speaking to his people through the Old Testament and through the new writings of the apostles that were recorded and grouped together in the New Testament. But how do I know that the Bible I have today is what they had then? If the story is about Jesus, about what he said and did, were told and retold until they were written down and then they were copied and copied. How do I know the copies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for example, or the letters are the same as they had then? Well, that's going to be another brain workout. Let's play a game. Your leader is going to whisper like a pretty long, complicated sentence into one of your ears, and then you're going to whisper it in the next person, next person, next person, all the way till the end. You can't repeat yourself. You can only whisper it once. And when you get to the last person, they're going to say it out loud and compare it to the first person. If your group's really big, maybe split into two groups or this will take way too long. Did your starting sentence and ending sentences match? Did they match exactly, sort of? Some people think this is like how we got our Bibles, but there's a really big difference from what you just did and how the chain of the oral tradition and the written tradition of our Bibles carried forward. Young rabbis were often forbidden to comment on a passage of scripture until they had memorized it perfectly. In fact, it was not uncommon for rabbis of Jesus' time 
to commit the entire Torah to memory. I've sometimes heard people say, look, I've been in a situation where I whisper something to someone, they whisper it to someone else, and it goes through 10 or 11 people, and by the time the last person tells what was said, it's totally different from what I told the first person. And we can't trust the Gospels for the same reason, because it was transmitted over a long period of time. That illustration is really a bad analogy, and you have to understand that the first century apostles who passed on information about Jesus were deeply concerned to get this information correct, because they saw it as sacred, holy tradition. It wasn't about what Joe was eating for dinner last Wednesday night. In our day of instant media and everything has to be on film or tape recorded, we are more skeptical of oral tradition, but we don't really understand the nature of oral tradition. Oral tradition is a community event. A story is passed down by individuals within that community. Well, if they get it wrong, you've got an entire community that's going to correct them. So it is self-correcting all the way. These stories um, were passed on reliably because they were passed on by the community of disciples. In fact, we now have scholarly studies that have been done of oral cultures, and we know that through several generations, oral tradition can be preserved and passed on without changing a thing. Okay, so once the Bible is written down, how did those copies get passed on? Do we have the original copy sitting somewhere in like a museum or something? The earliest known copies of the Gospels were written on sheets of papyrus and scrolls made of animal skins. They are among the oldest existing manuscripts of antiquity. The Codex Sinaiticus was authored between AD 330 and 350. It contains almost all of the New Testament and a significant portion of the Old, while the Codex Vaticanus from the same era is a nearly complete Greek copy of the entire Bible. A papyrus fragment from the 18th chapter of John dates to A.D. 125, less than a single generation after the Gospel was originally written. When I found out that we have no original survivors of the manuscripts of the New Testament, I became very skeptical. Because if all we have are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, then how do we know that what we possess today bears any resemblance to what the original said? We have better manuscript attestation for the New Testament than any other ancient document. For example, the, the Bible of the Greeks, Homer's Iliad, is preserved in maybe 600 manuscripts, the oldest of them a thousand years after the document was actually written. The New Testament, we have something like 5,000 Greek manuscripts. So everyone agrees, whether liberal or conservative, that we have an incredibly reliable New Testament. We have thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament. We also have virtually the entire New Testament preserved in the quotations of the Church Fathers in the first four centuries, so that if we had no copies of the New Testament, we could reconstruct the New Testament from quotations from the early Church Fathers. The oldest physical copies align with what we have today, what you have printed in front of you. The New Testament was written so much closer to the events that happened than any other ancient work. And it has so many more early copies than any other ancient work. So we can trust that what we have today is the most accurate, by far, ancient piece of documentation in all of history. But how do we know when the Gospels were written down? How do you know what time, what year, and how do we know they were actually close to the original events? Take a look in your table of contents again. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the Gospels, and that's what we've mostly been talking about in the recording of the eyewitness testimony. There are many different historical reasons we believe those were written down and passed and copied early on. And I'm gonna give you one big example, but there are lots more. There are some times recorded in the Gospels where Jesus predicts something that's going to happen. For example, the main thing he predicts is his death, burial, and resurrection. We'll look at one example in Matthew. It's a story, maybe some of you guys know it, where Jesus is transfigured with Elijah and Moses standing beside him on the mountain and the disciples see this, and they also hear a voice from heaven. And then, verse 30, Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now it is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Verse 33 is John helping us understand. He's like saying, hey, he said that to show the kind of death he was going to die. 
several times when Jesus makes a prediction, the author of the gospels can't help but say something like, hey, and then it was fulfilled when this happened, pointing out how he made a prediction and then that prediction was fulfilled. In Mark 13 and in Matthew 24, there's a really detailed example of this. On one of those days, as they were exiting the temple complex, one of the disciples said to Jesus, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Jesus foretold the destruction of Jerusalem, and he warned his followers to be on their guard, for they would be arrested, tried, tortured, and killed on account of their association with him. In 70 AD, some 37 years after Jesus gave this prediction, Rome sacked Jerusalem and destroyed it. The historian Josephus actually witnessed the siege and aftermath and said, now as soon as the army had no more people to slay or to plunder because there remained none to be the objects of their fury, Titus Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the entire city and temple. Other than a few towers and forts for the Roman garrison, everything was destroyed. It was so thoroughly laid even with the ground by those that dug it up to the foundation that there was left nothing to make those that came thither believe Jerusalem had ever been inhabited. The Wars of the Jews, or History of the Destruction of Jerusalem, Book 7, Chapter 1. Then about 60 years later, the Roman Emperor Hadrian commenced with finishing the job of the complete Romanization of Jerusalem and much of the land of Israel. By 135 AD, nearly 600,000 Judeans were killed and over 1,000 towns and villages were razed to the ground. These massive stones lying here at the base of the southern section of the Temple Mount are a testimony to the fulfilled prophecy of Jesus. From 70 to 135 AD, the Roman soldiers completely stripped the Temple Mount bare. Every stone was thrown down and the survivors, the remnant of the Jewish people, well, they were scattered to the four corners of the earth. Jesus predicted this so accurately. And yet in Mark or in Matthew, neither of them say, and that totally happened in 70 AD, or hey, that totally happened a few years later. Remember everyone when the temple was destroyed? If they had been written down, after the destruction of the temple, they certainly would have pointed out that it had come to pass as proof of Jesus' ability to know what was to come. And yet they don't. This is one of the ways we know that Mark, especially, must have been written before 70 AD. However, there's another explanation that sometimes people give, and you might hear this as you get older. Some people will use this exact thing to say that because he predicts the destruction of the temple, therefore it must have happened and been written down after 70 AD, after the temple was destroyed. What assumptions are people making when they think this way? If people assume that the only way that we could have such an accurate prediction is because it was written down after the actual event, they're assuming that prediction must have been made up. They're assuming that Jesus, that no person would have the ability to make such a prediction. So they're using the assumption that, hey, it's not possible for Jesus to have predicted that accurately. In other words, it's not possible for Jesus to do a miracle to demonstrate and to say, oh, and therefore that proves that the date of Mark is late which in turn attacks the reliability of the gospels. It's like circular reasoning. It's like, because we assume that Jesus couldn't possibly have known what was to come, therefore this was written late, therefore it's not accurate, therefore this is made up about Jesus, but it's just circular reasoning. Let's do another demonstration. Break into your pairs again, and one of you, you're going to tell a brief story. Right now, put up your hand if you're going to be the storyteller. Okay, put up your hand if you're going to be the story listener.
You're only really going to have 90 seconds. And when the 90 seconds are up, you have to have... We'll come back to why you just told stories in a second. The gospels were written in a way that's like the way people actually tell stories of things they remember. Those of you who are listeners, put up your hand if the teller kind of told you some random details, especially as they were trying to tell the story quickly in 90 seconds. I bet they did. How many of you have read novels or like to read novels? Today, writers write fictional stories that use real random details that have characters' thoughts in them that describe in details the, the surroundings and what's going on and all that sort of stuff. But no one at all wrote fiction like that until hundreds of years after Jesus. Yet the Gospels are full of that sort of details that you would expect to find in a real life story that someone was telling someone else. I'll give you one of my favorite examples of a random detail. So this happens at the end of John's Gospel after Jesus has died, risen from the dead three days later, and he is making appearances to the disciples. So Peter and a bunch of the other disciples are out fishing because they don't really know what to do and what they're supposed to do now. And they see this random guy on the shore. They've been fishing all night. They didn't catch any fish. And the random guy is like, cast your nets on the other side. And they cast their nets on the other side and they catch all these fish. And that's when Peter realizes, oh my goodness, it's Jesus. And they race to the shore to meet Jesus. In verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. And it was full of large fish, 153 of them. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. So why did he bother saying that there was 153 fish and that the net wasn't torn? What's the meaning behind that? Nothing. There is no meaning behind that. This isn't a metaphor for anything. It's just some random detail because John remembered that. And when you're sharing eyewitness testimony, random details like that come out. This is one of those pieces of evidence that this is real eyewitness testimony because people in Jesus' day did not make up fictional stories in that way. There's good evidence that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are eyewitness testimony, that they have been accurately preserved for us. And that's awesome. But how do we know that it's the word of God? That those words are different from other books, that they actually are the way God is revealing himself to us. And what about the other books? What about Acts? All the letters in the New Testament and the Revelation, that one's really crazy. We're gonna have to talk more about that next week. I've already given you guys tons of information you need some more time to unpack. So take some time as a group to dig into a few of these questions. Life group leaders, you can maybe choose to focus on the ones you think are gonna be most important for your group. How do you engage with the Bible when it's like hard to understand or boring or confusing or seems to contradict itself? What do you do about that? How do you stay reading it? If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then why is it worth the work to read and understand the Bible, even though it's like this ancient document that's hard to understand at times? Hearing more about how we got our Bible, does that make you more or less confident that it is God's word? If more, why? If less, why? What questions do you hope we're gonna talk about next week about how to know the Bible is God's word? Today, as you pray, you can take some time to thank God for the Bible. Thank him that he has revealed himself to us through creation, as we've talked about, through his son, most of all, but also through his word. Take time to thank him that we don't have to guess who he is, that he has revealed himself to us. And we'll see you next week.